Our third crisis type are events outside the organization's control, and in this lecture we'll talk about what we mean by these, including changes in how they're conceptualized, as well as their implications on stakeholder attitudes and crisis response considerations. When this topology was first considered, the delineation between events that the organization could be held accountable for, might be held accountable for, and couldn't really be held accountable for, was a relatively easy set of lines to draw. Though organizations might do well or flub the responses to each of these types of crises. This meant that reputational problems, which we'll talk about in our next lecture, were always included in this type of crisis because they centered on rumors and things done to the organization. However, as crisis research has developed, it's become clear that there's a difference in crisis communication processes, outcomes, and stakeholder needs when we're talking about crises with a material component, something that poses a credible threat to stakeholders, and ones where really all the risk lies with the organization. As a result, I've separated events outside the organization's control from reputational crises. So in this lecture, we're only focusing on those outside the organization's control. So what are these? As I alluded to in the previous slide, I think there's a pretty clear distinction based on the type of risk. With an event outside the organization's control, the organization is patently not to blame for the situation occurring. Even if the organization is prepared for this type of event, it has no control over whether it happens or not. However, with these events, both the organizations and stakeholders have a clear stake in what's happening in the crisis. There is some element of direct impact on both of these types of groups. There are four types of crises that have really been identified that fit into this category, and they range in levels of impact from attitudinal to physical risk. We'll go through each of them, define them, discover them, and offer examples of them. First, and arguably the one that involves the least fear would be shifting political attitudes or cultural attitudes. One of the challenges that organizations face today are shifting social and political expectations. Where organizations are successful in keeping up and staying ahead of them, these issues don't escalate into crises. However, in some cases, organizations and entire industries can come under greater scrutiny because of changing attitudes. Now, Political attitudes and cultural changes happen all the time, and organizations don't necessarily face crises from them. However, when these shifts are coupled with some kind of trigger, that's when the potential for the crisis really emerges. For example, in the agriculture industry, there had been a long debate about food production pra practices, criticisms of companies like Monsanto, criticisms of factory farming, and, and these were all reported in the news. However, these really didn't cause a crisis in the industry. That happened when the documentary Food Incorporated was released and gave people a look inside and what factory farming animals for food consumption in the U.S. actually looked like. The thing about the film was that it evoked strong reactions from people who watched it, even people who were already aware of the problem and disagreed with the practices. Now, if you haven't seen it, even the most staunchly carnivorous of us cringed a bit at the thought of eating meat right after it. So what it did was made the problem personal for people. It got a massive amount of media coverage, and this actually led to serious changes in the ways that many companies source their meat. For example, because of the outrage at McDonald's and most fast food restaurants about pink slime, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, just watch the film, well, the consumers demanded that the manufacturers change their processing. Because McDonald's and the other fast food companies are such big customers, this meant that the entire production process had to change. The point is that shifting political and cultural attitudes can lead to crises that will affect companies and even industries. Yet these changes are largely out of the control of companies unless they have some very active and effective issues management processes in place that can head them off and to be ahead of such political and cultural attitude shifts. A second type of event outside the organization's control are acts of malevolence towards the organization. Think of this as sabotage or even product tampering. There have been a lot of examples of this in terms of clashes between environmental activists and energy pr 
production and logging companies however there are also examples of this that have come along and genuinely train changed industries and companies because of them the case that not only changed how food and medicines are produced and handled but is also probably responsible for the most meaningful growth and development of the field of issues and crisis management was the Tylenol case. The pretext to this case was that not long before the crisis, as a company, Tylenol had gotten together to try and brainstorm what could go wrong for them. Because they were trying to prepare for the worst case scenarios. One of the scenarios that they brainstormed was about product tampering. Fast forward to 1982, and in Chicago, Illinois, where someone who had taken Tylenol was poisoned by cyanide, and then another. At this point, no one knew what had happened. So, whether it was an entire batch of Tylenol that had been tainted, they had no idea what was occurring. So, Tylenol took the decision to pull all of their products from the shelf until the problem could be identified. As it turned out, it was someone who had gotten into the pharmacies in Chicago and poisoned some bottles of the painkiller with cyanide. But because of their swift action, the company earned the trust and the respect of pretty much everyone. And so because of their response, it was a successful outcome to a very risky situation. But this case also changed laws and practices. It received so much attention that safety seals on consumables began to be added to ensure that consumers could have the confidence that the food and medicines they were receiving hadn't been tampered with. It's also an example of a response that combines the material response with a communicative response to show the symbolic nature of crisis management and crisis communication. Obviously, natural disasters fall into the category of events that are clearly outside an organization's locus of control. However, that doesn't mean that organizations can't be prepared for them. And herein is how organizations are judged in the wake of disasters. The study of disasters has been a growing area of research interest for crisis management and crisis communication since the problematic Hurricane Katrina response in the U.S., However, since the 2011 Fukushima nuclear disaster and the 2015 Ebola crisis, researchers and practitioners have really focused on the intersection of disaster management and crisis communication, with a lot of the research focusing not just on traditional mechanisms for response, but realizing that social media is a vital way for not only communicating with publics, but also getting live updates about what's happening during disasters. Disasters are also interesting from a crisis communication context because they pose unique challenges since so many of them are global and end up demanding a serious reconsideration of policy and a approach in their wake. For example, in the wake of the Fukushima disaster, governments across Europe, including Switzerland, Austria, and Germany, have reflected on nuclear energy and decided that the risks to their populations are too great to continue to pursue nuclear energy as a viable option, have invested otherwise. However, countries like the UK and France continue to develop nuclear energy. So debates about disasters and disaster response are complex and often challenging in the aftermath. However, the immediate crisis response is also often complex as well because of the fear-based responses that they're likely to invoke. We'll be talking more about stakeholder emotion later in the lecture series, but strong emotional responses, as we've already discussed, make crisis communication even more challenging. And finally, when we're talking about crises invoking fear, we have to talk about terrorist attacks and external violence. This is one of the most understudied types of crises in the field of crisis communication, yet this is an area where crisis communication can probably offer the most direct benefit. Of course, issues of social violence and terror attacks remains on people's minds these days because of the litany of attacks um, and many different types of groups involved in many different companies. However, the Charlie Hebdo attacks were communicatively particularly interesting for a num number of reasons. Hebdo, as an organization, was obviously targeted because of its politics, but it offers a profound example of, of how events outside the organization's control can affect people's identities, attitudes, and even behaviors. Hebdo's response, I suspect, had something to do with the larger social response in that their core argument was that they were going to be undeterred by the events, that they were going to remain controversial, 
but emerging around it seemed to be a complementary shift in public sentiment around Europe and beyond, where the events seemed to galvanize attitudes in a much more community-oriented kind of way. In the wake of the attacks, we saw others in, in places where people, organizations, and governments were all communicating about safety and perseverance. This is a marked difference from the larger social response to the 9-11 attacks in the U.S., where the immediate response from the U.S. government focused on both fear and retribution. Research is just beginning to investigate the connections between responses to terrorism and outcomes for organizations and populations. But these, along with natural disasters and other events outside the organization's control, indicate very different approaches to crisis communication when compared to organization-centric communication. In these cases, organizations have an important role to play. However, their role is as a member of a larger community, where we can expect to see communication from government and probably at multiple levels engagement from stakeholders, and broader social and legal conversations beginning to take place. In these cases, how an organizational comes out of the situation will largely depend on their response. Because the situation wasn't of their making, their crisis response provides them an opportunity to show what their organization is about, its values, and what it can do for its stakeholders at functional or practical levels, as well as at emotional and metaphorical levels. So when we look to the question then with these crises of how much crisis type influences responses, we again come back to the proposition that the emotion involves evokes more negative reactions. However, the core research findings here do differ. What remains consistent is that anxiety has to be managed. Because of the nature of these crises, anxiety is probably the first emotion that has to be managed by organizations trying to respond to them. But four other key factors come into play based on contemporary research. First, while we've already talked about agenda setting and the importance of the media, in cases of disaster, the effects of how media frame situations are even now more pronounced. Rather than just getting topics on people's mind, the positioning of the crisis by media outlets across different platforms genuinely seems to influence public opinion. Second, the information needs in cases of disasters, terror attacks, or any situation where broad groups of people could be affected are different from crises where those directly effective is a much more narrowly defined demographic. But the problem then becomes about information needs versus the most effective means of delivery. Third, this is where social media comes into play. In times past, reliance was always on television and radio for information to be broadcast very quickly during emergencies. However, as we know, during major disasters, television and radio may not have the most immediate Im information available, and in fact, they may not even be available to people if they're on the move. So research is finding that social media is emerging as a vital part of a broad disaster response, both as a means of getting intelligence about the situation, as well as a means of communicating to the broadest possible audience. Finally, in each of these kinds of crises, government communication about the situation is vital, and so considering government response in combination with organizations affected, as well as its own, is increasingly complex because there are issues about first responders, leadership, management, coordination, as well as legal and legislative roles for governments to play depending on the particular moment, all of which require engagement with different groups and in many communities. It means that government actors have to be coordinating with populations that may or may not necessarily actually trust them. While all crises afford opportunities for developing our understanding and practice more, events outside the organization's control represent a groundbreaking area for study and practice to emerge with innovations occurring all the time. From the field of communication as well as technology, industry, government, and health organizations. These are a few sources to get you started in developing your knowledge of them.